to run the world's largest student movement for social enterprise. I'm talking a year long competition with over 100,000 young people in 120 countries working to create high impact startups that address pressing problems facing the planet, where the winning team receives 1 million US dollars in funding to make their idea a reality. Oh my gosh, and our guest today is ideally qualified to lead the student movement as their CEO, and you're going to love hearing how she does it all. Stay tuned for the Startup Life live show. Let's glow, everyone. Hello and welcome to the Startup Life Live Show. I'm your host, Andy Lyons, four times founder and startup champion to founders around the world. And boy, am I happy you carved out time to tune in to this delicious conversation today. I know you're going to get some great nuggets, but you're also going to be enlivened and inspired by this incredible organization and its commitment to help the planet and solve some of our amazing pressing problems. Now, I know you have a lot of pressing problems as well because you're a startup founder. And so I'm so grateful that you carved out time to tune in and up your founder game because that's right, as you do better, your business will do better, right? So let me just share a few little things here. If you are tuning in on any of the video uh, platforms, you know, we're live on LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, be sure to tap that thumbs up button. And if you're tuning in from YouTube, be sure to subscribe as well as hit that thumbs up button and to receive an alert whenever I post a new show because we have some great guests on this show that I know can help your founder journey and your startup journey, please be sure to subscribe right over here and join our Startup Life Live meetup group. That way you get a deep dive into all the cool folks that we have on this show. The links are in the startup notes and I hope that you'll, I'll see you there as well. Uh, and by the way, whenever you like the video that where you're watching from, it goes out into the world, you know, those algorithms and it reaches more folks and you never know that ripple effect is very powerful. A founder may tune in and have an incredible aha moment. So thank you for sharing the video wherever you're glowing. I have some Andy delicious advice I want to share with you today. And it is all about asking. And I'm just going to tell you one of my, one of my favorite uh, Chinese proverbs. I like to genderize it, though, and say she, but she, he, them. It says, she who asks is a fool for five minutes, maybe. But she who does not ask remains a fool forever. And I know you're in the founder seat and there's like so much new going on. You don't even know what you don't know. So if you're feeling hesitant to ask or you're feeling shameful, this is so typical of the founder journey. I should know that. No, you shouldn't. You should not know that. Asking is so important. And I'm just going to put this up here to remind you to just ask. And what happens when you don't ask, you start with the whole shooting, right? You start shooting all over yourself and that never works. But what I want you to take away from this Andy-licious advice is that asking for help is a gift to you, your startup, and the person you ask for help. Here's why. When you ask for help, you're providing an opportunity for someone to give, right? Which is a gift to them. You know how good it feels when you help someone, right? That's the gift you're giving someone when you ask them for help. So please do not hesitate. Give a gift to someone today and ask them for help. I know it will help you and your startup. All right. I am so excited to introduce our guest today. It's Lori Van Dam. And let me just bring up a little artwork first. And then I'm going to play this really great video. She's the CEO of Hult Prize, an organization that inspires student entrepreneurs to solve the world's biggest challenges through innovative social enterprises with positive global impact. But get ready for this incredible video. This shares how it all happens. Every year, university students from countries all over the world 
gather for a chance to change it. 100,000 student entrepreneurs, 120 countries, a million dollar prize, 15,000 startups with the potential to affect every single one of us. Oh my gosh, how amazing is that? And Lori leads this one, this HALT prize. But let me tell you, her deep nonprofit background prepared her for this incredible experience and leadership opportunity. She worked at the One Fund Boston, which was created by the mayor of Boston and governor of Massachusetts to provide support for the 2013 Boston Marathon bombing victims. And for 20 years, she worked for Education First, a global education company. Oh my gosh, let's bring her into the room. Let's not wait another second. Lori Vendel. <laughs> Oh, the crowds around the world are just like, I am, I am so inspired by that video, Lori. Oh, my I know, gosh. I know. They're so good. And they work so hard, these students. And the ones who, uh, there were some, some uh, shots from our accelerator in Boston last fall. And, you know, that's at that time, 30 startups out of 15,000, like what they had to do to get there is really so impressive. It is so impressive. I don't know about you guys, when I watched that web video, I waved back. I'm like, oh, hi. <laughs> it's, I feel such connection. Let um, Folks, where are you hanging out around the world today? Where are you tuning in from? Let us know. I'm here and we'll do a little accessibility moment. I'm here in Boston. I have short blonde hair, white skin, and a big friggin' smile, and lots of anti-liciousness. And Lori is right down the road. I can mwah, blow kisses to Lori right down the road. Where are you hanging from, Lori? Uh, well, as it happens, I'm in New Hampshire, so I'm just oh. a slight uh, hop skip up the road. Uh, up the road. <laughs> Um, and I also have short blonde hair and very pasty white skin. Smile, <laughs> because I do love to smile. Oh, and you are working for such a wonderful organization. That's right, Ruth. Isn't it amazing? I mean, Ruth is from Nairobi. So, oh, and she's Ruth, our community. In Nairobi this past summer, we're working with uh, Strathmore University. They're going to host our, uh, our summit in Nairobi in June. Oh my gosh, that's wonderful. And up in Canada, we have Brent from Ottawa, Canada. He's our diverse fan, always reminding everybody that innovation comes when you are disabled and they need our disabled folks absolutely need a seat at the table and he has an delicious moment to celebrate what happened he became a web accessibility consultant on monday so look at we love to celebrate folks wins Yay. hooray brent from ottawa canada that's wonderful news all right, Lori, you know, and oh, I do want to remind folks who are watching, but might be a little on the quiet side, you know, you can amplify your brand. So if you've got a startup, all right, throw the name of your startup, the one liner and the URL and Lori and I will celebrate you. And if you have questions, pick our brains, come on, pop them into the comment section because we all learn from each other and it's evergreen, right? So someone could watch this and three or four years, right, Lori? And just have, I would have had that question too. So please do not hesitate. We are all here for each other on the Startup Life Live show. Okay, Lori. So I, you know, I mentioned briefly about, you know, your background, your deep background in nonprofit, but I also like to find out from my guests, like what compelled them? I mean, you've been in this arena for quite a few decades. <laughs> <laughs> and so what compelled you and called you to focus all that bright, beautiful energy of yours into the nonprofit arena? And what lights you up about changing the world? Because at the Education Foundation, everywhere you've brought your presence, you have been changing the world. Well, uh, that's such a juicy question. <laughs> Uh, I am fortunate to be a first generation American. My dad came to the U.S. from Europe when he was 13. Um, and we, as a result, had the chance to travel to Europe when I was growing up. And that experience just changes you. Um, my dad is an educator. My mom was an educator. Um, so the idea that uh, young people have um, both the power and the opportunity to really bring impact really uh, is something I just grew up with. It was part of the air that I breathed. 
Um, my dad is 84 and still teaching undergraduates. So uh, that is, uh, yeah, he, he, he gets applause for sure. Um, so I mean, he's the gift that keeps on giving. I mean, teachers, right? Yeah, no, incredible. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, so that was all, uh, when I found EF, when I was 24 years old, it was like all of the things coming together, um, the opportunity to, uh, work with other people who had my same, um, uh, interest in the world and interest in travel and education. And how do you combine those things? Experiential education, yeah. classroom education, um, all of that uh, was just uh, completely resonated, resonated yeah. with me. And how did you get tapped to work on, you know, the one fund? I mean, that that's huge. You know, folks, we were, as you can imagine, seriously impacted by the bombing at the marathon. I mean, that just, and <laughs> I love that they found the folks who did it within days. I mean, yeah. there was no long investigation. They tracked those folks down. Yeah. Um, how did you get tapped for that, Lori? Well, it's, it's the advice I'm going to say to everyone. It was through my connections. I have never gotten a job that was not because somebody I knew was connected with the opportunity. Um, and in that case, they had been speaking with a former colleague and a friend of mine uh, about the role. Um, you know, the one fund was supposed to open, taking a bunch of money and then close. So it was all done pro bono. Um, but when it became clear that there was actually a need for it to stick around, the board of directors went to the one fund community and said, we're going to spend a little bit of your money to hire some staff to actually make this thing go. Is that OK? And the community said yes. Um, and so they started looking and uh, my friend called me and said, I don't think this is the right role for me, but it could be the right role for you. And uh, that was it. And I was fortunate enough to start uh, in February of uh, the first anniversary year mm -hmm. and be part of the uh, planning of and then executing the anniversary tribute with uh, then Vice President Biden. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I uh, am so uh, delighted that you have a disability consultant as one of your viewers, because I do think um, having been exposed to those uh, survivors who were injured um, in the bombing, both with visible injuries and invisible injuries, um, there was an enormous amount of hearing impacts in the one fund community, which is a hidden disability for a lot of people. Um, really uh, opened my eyes and uh, allowed me to learn um, and I'm still very uh, closely connected with uh, a number of the members of that community. Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> That's a beautiful story and a great reminder. And I know Brent is out there cheering right now because there's so many invisible disabilities, right? And whether it's neuro or hearing or il illnesses, you know, there's so much we don't see. But boy, when you have a disability, you are very innovative and in how to make things work with all the abled folks out there. So thank you for that. And we have a few folks tuning in. The Hope Price family loves you, Lori. Oh, hi, Cammy. Thank you. We love Yay. you. Yay, Cammy. Hi. Mm -hmm. And look at, I love this, something fierce, Felix. Felix Prince from Ghana. Our startup name is Wiseware, and he's spelling that W-I-Z-W-E-R for the podcast listeners. I'm a graphic designer as well. Woohoo! You I nailed it, Felix. It. Yay, you. That's exactly how we love to have it happen here in the Startup Life live show. That's right, Brent. Lori is speaking to your soul. I love it. Hooray, hooray. So, Lori, you know, having the, all these great experiences, you still, and, and thank you for sharing how your childhood growing up, you know, as an educator, as a parent and, and being exposed very to the international community and, and where your, your love for changing the world, but nonprofit for also for educating people, because education is really how we can come together and connect in a better way. Um, I, you know, as you went through these different roles, you've been prepared to be a CEO and so the CEO of the Hulk Prize because you were willing to, you know, move up the ladder, so to speak, in these nonprofits, get the experiences you needed, but also have the missteps that were are required. Can you talk a little bit of some of the learning things that you, moments that you had as you were moving up through into the the bigger roles and leadership roles of these larger organizations? Oh my goodness! Uh, or was it all smooth sailing? <laughs> it was not, Andy. No, it was not. Uh, I, 
look back on those experiences with enormous gratitude because uh, people were willing to give me really tough feedback and that is a gift. Um, and when I, uh, you know, have people who are working with me who are experiencing similar challenges, I remind them that the fact that someone cared enough about you to tell you to your face how terrible you are is an enormous gift and one that you have to take very seriously. Um, and they do that. And, and they do that, right, Lori, to raise the bar so that you start ha you raising the bar for yourself. They raise it for you by saying, uh-uh, we need you up here. That is a gift to you. So I'm so glad you mentioned that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so early in my career, the first time that I was managing a team of people, um, I was really driving hard and uh, was not in any way an effective manager. I was very directive. I was very um, uh, my way or the highway. Uh, talked a lot about I, I need this, I'm that, I this, that, and the other. Uh, and my whole team essentially mutinied and went to my boss and said, it's her or us. What are you going to do? Uh <laughs> okay. So <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a wake up moment. Mm -hmm. But they sat down one by one. There were five of them. And for about an hour a piece, they told me all the ways in which I had been, um, Driving them crazy? And, yeah, driving them crazy and getting in their way and, and not supporting them and uh, making it about me. Um, and then my boss, who has been a lifelong mentor for me uh, at the time, sat me down and she said, okay, so what did they tell you? And I gave her the list and, uh, and she said, okay, you know, this one is a real problem and you can solve it this way. This one, it's going to go away. Like, don't worry about it. And she helped me kind of understand what I could do differently. Yeah. Um, and how and, to triage <laughs> and how to triage. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause it was so much information. Um, but how and, did you not go, just go, I'm out of here because I can't handle this. And a oh, lot of people do that, you know, from their yeah. mentors, cause they want to be perfect. They want to just do it right, right out of the bat. And, and they don't want to believe that the feedback is true. How did you take that in? Uh, I just love that. Well, it was clear that it was true because it was coming from all of them. If it had just been one, maybe I would have been like, eh. Um, but, uh, I'm very stubborn. If you tell me I can't do something, that's when I'm like very determined. Um, so, you know, I spent, like I said, probably four hours in a conference room with the door closed, listening to them and crying and crying and crying. And then I went into the team room and I said, I'm going to go home, <laughs> think about this. And I'm going to come back tomorrow. And they told me later, like, oh, we took bets. Like we were confident you were not coming back. But that's just not who I am. So I put well, my big girl pants on and went back in the next day and really tried to implement the the things that I had been, um, you know, told to to think about. And I was able to do that. I, I have to tell you, I'm just having an incredible. Oh, well, founders, you know what this is about. This is a founder journey moment. We need to applause what Laurie just said. Because this is going to happen to you. Your team is going to be giving you the WTF moment. Like, what the heck are you doing? And you have to take the feedback. You're going to know. And if you have, as Lori did, a really good mentor to help you filter out some of the stuff that might be garbage or might go away, et cetera, you are going to get so much better at leading and empowering others toward the vision of the company's mission and initiative. So I love something fierce, Lori. And I'm so grateful that you felt comfortable enough to share that story because a lot of folks don't want to tell like some of those things that where <laughs> you get raked over the coals, but <laughs> it's real. It's life. Everybody's going to experience it. I just think it's important to talk about things that are true. Yeah. And I also think it's important to say, and you can keep going, right? right. Like, you don't have to let that stop you and you don't have to let it derail you. You don't have to change your focus but you can do it in a way that brings other people along with you. Right. Um, and that, you know, what did I know at 24? Nothing. You just went so, in and by the seat of your pants thought you'd do, be showing people what to do. And exactly. it wasn't working. It was not going over. And also, you know, when that kind of representation for everybody to understand is that, yes, you can come back and go, okay, as Maya Angelou always said, 
When you know better, you do better. Exactly. Ta-da! There yeah. it is. So we have some questions here and some more howdy do's. Um, but first of all, we've got a question from Batul, and he's saying, is the Halt, or she's saying, is the Halt Prize Fashion Challenge for 2023 restricted only to university students? Others can't participate? I'm afraid that is correct. You have to be enrolled in some capacity in a degree granting program in order to participate in the Halt Prize. So undergrad, grad, undergrad, PhD, grad. Yep. whatever, but you have to be enrolled. You have okay. to be enrolled. I'm there sorry. And then um, while you were talking about, you know, leadership and all, Fetty chimed in and said, thank you, Lori. I totally agree. And then Joanna says, always learning with you, Lori. And see, that's My beautiful. Is awesome. Oh. I love them. Oh, you know, and so it's important, folks, because, you know, as you're learning, your team is learning and you're growing together and it brings more humanity to the experience. So I'm going to pull up. I just love all this incredible artwork you shared with us. So let's talk a little bit about the Hulk Prize. And I'm just going to throw these up, folks. I'm going to get serious and, and hold on to one. But let's talk about the Hulk Prize. And first of all, I want to know, How'd they get you? Like, how did you learn about it? How did they onboard you? So the Halt Prize is funded by the Halt family. Bertel Halt is the founder of EF Education, which is where I spent 20 years of my career and where I had that experience. I will also say uh, when we have more time, another time I'll tell you the story about how. Uh, so I worked directly for Bertel. He tried really hard to fire me and I refused to be fired. So uh, that was another learning opportunity. <laughs> Okay, so everybody, Lori um, embraces and represents the word grit. Yes, <laughs> you have, I do, yes. You've had to tap love... into that important ingredient. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, so, yes, yeah, so I spent 20 years at, at EF in a variety of roles, um, including with the Halt International Business School, which is our academic partner. Um, and then I left to see, you know, what else was out there. And that's when I was with the One Fund and other organizations, um, and, uh, I always stayed in touch because I had made the greatest friends and the greatest mentors. Um, and I have such enormous respect for the Halt family. Um, so, you know, when I started, it was the founder and then his sons joined the business, um, over time. And, uh, when this opportunity, uh, arose, I was in the very fortunate position to have an existing relationship with the family and particularly because the Halt price is, their name, right? It's right. their mission. It's their heart that's kind of out there in the world. Um, I think they were really looking for someone who knew them well and who could kind of uh, seamlessly slide into that um, that ethos. So I feel incredibly fortunate um, that this opportunity arose and that I was, um, you know, in a position to, to take advantage yeah, of it. Yeah, I am too. So share with everybody the history of the Hell Prize. When did they, when did they found the school? First of all, I don't even know that. So Health International Business School of Business. School, so it had uh, its roots in the Arthur G. Little School of Management. So okay. the school itself is many decades old. Did you say uh, Arthur D. Little? I did say Arthur G. Little. There's a flashback for you, right? Oh, my God, folks, my first job in real corporate America no. was at ADL. No. <laughs> Got to say hi to my good friend, Nancy, because that's okay, everybody. You know that I love my good friend, Nancy, here. So let me just bring that up. That's where I met my Aww. lifelong friend, Nancy J. Gray. Aww, oh, my gosh. That. Okay, so ADL. So it's, it's decades old. When did they and why did they decide to create then the HALT prize. Like, I know this was in 2009, I believe. Correct. Yep. Yeah. So 2024 will be our 15th anniversary, which we're super excited about. I know. Um, so uh, it was the I, sort of the brainchild of a group of Halt International business students who um, wanted to, uh, there was a, a presentation from the gentleman who started One Laptop Per Child. And he was saying, you know, our biggest challenge is to get it to the um, end users. And so this group of students said, what if we did a, a competition to try to figure out some, you know, do a um, almost like a charrette to, to figure out what right. uh, some solutions could be. And that was really the genesis. Um, and uh, as it started to gain momentum within the six campuses of the Halt International Business School around the world, um, the pitch was made to the founder of EF, Bertel Halt, if he would support it. And being a person who believes in 
uh, big measures and not small. He said, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it for a million dollars. And uh, we were off to the races. Oh, my gosh. Folks, I've been a judge at the Boston campus for, I think, four or five. This will be maybe, might be my fifth year coming up in February. I get so inspired, Lori, because, you know, we can look around the planet and go, oh, we're all going to die. Right. It's so easy. Then you go and every year there's an initiative and we'll talk about this year's initiative in a second. But these students go after solving these big, hairy problems and they're so innovative and their ideas are so actionable. And Mm -hmm. you're like, oh, my gosh, we aren't all going to die. In fact, these, you know, these young entrepreneurs are going to save the planet and humanity. And oh, my gosh, you know, and I always... (laughs) I come away just feeling like, oh, the world is in great hands. Okay. Innovation is the answer. But with the passion and insights that they bring, it is so remarkable. And I just, I, folks, go check out the Halt Prize. You know, I'm going to keep popping in the artwork here. But visit HaltPrize.org and you can follow. You can see where I on Lori's banner going around the bottom at Halt Prize. And just get, if you're having a tough day, go see what they're doing. And you're going to feel like there's hope. Yes. (laughs) Absolutely. I know. But you know, I love their mission. I love that it's social entrepreneurship. I love how they tie it into the UN's initiative. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, uh, very interesting. 2023 is the halfway point between uh, when the SDGs were announced and when they are supposed to be completed in 2030. Um, so this is a real moment of reckoning for- SDG oh, stands sorry, for- the Sustainable Development Goals. So these are, uh, I believe there are 17, mm-hmm. should have phoned up on that before we started, uh, where the UN has identified um, challenges in the world that they are trying to recruit as many organizations as possible to try to address them. And they range from equality for women to access to education, to, uh, you know, caring for the environment and the planet, Um, all the things that we know that are super important to do. And so when we present our challenges, they always sync up with at least one and generally more of the sustainable development goals so that um, we are part of this global effort to uh, make things sustainable for the for the for the planet. And this year's, I mean, I had a guest on the show uh, uh, a few uh, in December who has a fund for refashioning fashion, and I didn't understand. And folks, this is what the whole price goal is this year. First of all, the fashion industry needs an urgent makeover. And this photo, folks, there's shoes and clothing and purses and everything. It's like the landfill disaster. Okay. And what I didn't know is that because so much plastic is used in our clothing and then it gets into the water when we wash that we, it's been defined that we have up to one credit card size worth of plastics now in our bodies. They're finding them in umbilical cords. This is a really important problem to be solving. How did you all land on this year's 2023 Halt Prize Challenge Redesigning Fashion? So, uh, you know, there are certain kinds of topics that we have found to be successful for the Health Prize over time. Um, And one of the things that we really look for is something that can be approached from a lot of different angles. Um, And, you know, clothing is universal. Everybody has to wear clothes. So uh, it's something that's very relatable, but you can attack it from, as you say, you know, microplastics. You can attack it from transportation. You can attack it from water usage. You can attack it from uh, trying to reduce demand. How can you use influencers to uh, encourage people to look at what's good instead of what's new? Um, How digital fashion is an option, right? Like there's so many things. There. What, what is digital fashion? Andy. So I believe the statistic is, and we, we can look it up, um, that one in 10 garments is purchased to use for your social media. So yeah. digital fashion would be the idea, right? So the idea is that if you just wear a plain white t-shirt and then you can digitally put on, just like, you know, they put the little bunny ears on yeah. your or the little nose or whatever, put on a Gucci top. For the purposes of your live stream or your oh, social media. Oh my gosh. 
and you're wearing the same white t-shirt, but on screen, you look like you're wearing different outfits all the time. And I could be dressing like Emily in Paris, right? You could, you could dress like anybody you want. How about that? Okay. Now, anybody who knows me can be all over that. Oh my gosh. That is amazing. Thank you for explaining that. Oh, geez. And oh, Joanna has a wonderful comment here. Would you please read that? Can you see that, Laura? I can. So Joanna says the core values we embrace are also exceptional and so important. And I, I agree with her very much. They are Joanna so is in charge of our on-campus program based out of our office in uh, Lisbon. Oh, thank you for that, Joanna. And you know, this is the beauty of the Help Prize. It takes this whole international crowd and brings them together toward one purpose for all. And, and that's so beautiful. But let's get back to the, the fashion. So let's take it from step one. You come up, you meet as a group. What happens to that? And you decide this year, we're going for redesigning fashion, everyone. And yes. then what happens? And then what happens? So uh, we work as a team to identify uh, what we think the possible interventions are. We have a, a fantastic um, strategy and writing partner um, who's a dear old friend, who's a longtime EF person, whose name is Art. And Art and I and our leadership team work together to create the document, which is the challenge explanation, which you can download on our website. And it gives you not just, you know, here's how the competition works, but a, but a real set of resources around um, understanding what the challenges are, how the SDGs can be addressed by the fashion industry, some examples of companies that are already working in the space. So you can get an inspiration from them on um, how you can maybe think about different um, kinds of areas where there are problems that you could be interested in solving. Um, and, and then, you know, and then we... You take and then you take all these open applications and folks, you can visit, you can join the Hult Price as a competitor, provided you're enrolled at an educational institution and you go to hultprize.org. Exactly. So do you get, how many applications do you get? So uh, there's two paths to joining. Um, you can either join through a program that's operated on your college campus um, which is what you're going to be judging for the Boston Halt International Business School in February. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, more and more, we're finding that uh, there are people who are interested who don't necessarily have a program at their institution. Yep. So we also have our open application, which is what you were just showing. So I would have an idea. I would grab uh, a couple of friends. We have teams between three and five participants. Um, and we would put together a little video, a deck, a two-pager, um, and submit that through our online portal. And then you will be considered to move to the next phase of the competition, which is our in-person summits that will be happening in 10 cities around the world, plus two virtual uh, in June. Oh, my gosh, Lori. This yeah. is like so much to manage. I mean, I think about what you're leading and the team and everybody and all the points around the world that are doing their job and their work. It's extraordinary. This is a real collaboration. It is. And the summits in particular, uh, we do in a co-hosting model. So like I said, we're working with Strathmore University in Kenya. We're working with Tech de Monterey and Monterey, Mexico. So we have these connections with institutions around the world, um, and they will help us to execute these events for several hundred startups at each one. And then we will have one winner that will come out of that process. Um, but we also have our second chance round. So uh, if you competed in one of those summits, but you weren't chosen as the, as the one winner, you can uh, ask to be considered to still come to the accelerator. Um, oh, that's wonderful. So, that so now you, the summit has their finalists. The finalists go through the accelerator. And this is a way for you to sort of fine tune who's going to get the million dollar prize. Exactly. And then do you have a, like a, a few more steps or do you go right to the, the final prize competition? So we will have a total of 20 startups that will be selected through the 12 um, summits and then eight through the second chance round that will start our digital accelerator. And the digital accelerator will be where we will work with them um, really to make sure that there are um, products in the marketplace, that they are running businesses that are actually viable. And from that, we will select the six that will pitch in Paris in oh. September. 
Paris this year? Paris this year. Oh, Passion. how can you not be in Paris? Oh my gosh. Are you kidding? Of course it has to be in Paris, Paris. Oh my gosh. This is so exciting. So Lori, you were brought on almost two years ago, right? A year and a half. How long have you been? Yeah. yeah year and a half. So you were there for last year's finale. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about like, cause this was your first real experience in the right. trenches going, wow. Can you tell, you know, a lot of what you observed and how it made you feel and, and share with that final pitch? Because I watched it live because I could like it's so darn exciting. And President Clinton gets up at the end and he's the one who yeah. gives the prize and all the teams are jumping up and down. It's oh, I get goosebumps just recalling it. Yeah. What was it, it was like for you? Well, you know, you can watch it on the video and we have on our YouTube channel 2018 and 2017 and, and all that. So you can kind of get a sense of it, but it is nothing compared to um, the real thing. And part of what made 2022 so fun was that because we'd had two years where we weren't able to gather in person, we actually invited our 2020 winners and our 2021 winners to come and be part of the event. So they had a little expo where they were sharing how their businesses were progressing and they were in the audience to watch the six final pitches. Um, and that was really fun. It was really great to see them all in person and for them to be able to meet in person, which they hadn't had the chance to do. Um, and the actual pitches, I mean, it is legitimate to say that when we got into the judging room, there were very high emotions because people, different judges had different favorites and a case could have been easily made for any one of the six to be the million dollar winner. So whittling it down was very challenging. I can only imagine. Um, and the final selection, you know, I think everyone felt really great about, but but was equally sad that we didn't have more funding to give out because all of the six um, were deserving. And uh, stay tuned for an announcement about that because that's something we're going to be I am in 2023. I am very excited about that because I've always looked at the, you know, the three companies behind the winner going, how did they decide? Yeah. I mean, it's probably just so close and you'd love to give them, you know, something to help boost their idea and, and help bring it to market. Um, so I am going to be looking forward to that announcement, Laurie. So I'm so happy that yeah. you had that great experience. What do you think? This the startups, whether they're a local pitch to making it to the summit to you know and pitching there to getting into the accelerator, what is this you know the common feedback that you get about the experience that they have? I think uh, the piece that people uh, are surprised by in a way is that they continue to evolve so much. You know, you see, you think, or I think the startups think when they come to. Uh, let's say they're arriving at the accelerator, they think, you know, we've been doing this for seven months, we know what we need to do, we know how to frame it, we know how to pitch it, we we know how we're, um, what we stand for. Um, and at each phase of the competition, we're actually able to um, provide a lot of input, we have wonderful mentors um, who work with our teams, uh, and they really evolve. And so we really see uh, a big difference in terms of their uh, readiness for funding uh, over the course of the of the year long um, process. And I think, um, you know, there's, of course, there's been one startup that has won, for example, in 2022, and 14,999 that did not win a million dollars. But there are a large percentage of those teams that continue to work together either on the idea that they pitched or on a different idea or who go on to uh, create new teams. Um, and uh, we really hope that we are imparting the spirit of social entrepreneurship uh, to people who might not have known that that was even an option for them in terms of their careers. Um, so it's that that for us is, the, is even almost the bigger impact. And as a judge and as a four times founder, as I watched these students come together, many of them, have 
haven't known each other long. Right. This idea was something they brought together and collaborate. Well, why don't we do this? You're going to be good at this. You'll be great at the science. You'll be great at the marketing. You'll be great at the production. You know, they assigned themselves roles within this newly created and formed organization. But you can see that in their brains, in their eyes too, the spark of like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, no, no. Not only could we actually do this, but we're really going to help a community a region or a global impact that would just transform how we do things. And, and that's what gets me so excited. And no matter what happens, and I tell people all this, this all the time, you always win when you launch a business, even if it was just a theory that you took through the parts um, in a competition, because the skills you gather, right, Lori, as you collaborate, right. as you pull that idea together and you try to say, okay, what are the revenue projections? How will we monetize? How will we bring it to market? How do we prove the MVP? How do we, all that part, those are transferable skills to another gig. Right. Or you might be so inspired by what you learned you know, through the Halt Prize, et cetera, that you'll go on and start another company and you'll have a better idea of how to move and groove with that. Right. I right. think this the, is the team building piece of it, I think, is uh, something that people maybe don't know that they're going to get out of this experience, um, but they inevitably do. And it's incredibly valuable. I mean, you know this. It's it's all about who you have working with you to right. make your vision into a reality. Right. And folks, as a judge, too, you know, we're going through a list, you know, how um how measurable is this positive impact on people and the planet? How you know, are they really supporting the HALT Foundation's initiative that year? You know, there's a lot of questions that we use as well to filter out for the, the end result, which is the 20 plus eight folks, uh, teams that get to pitch at the final prize. Um, what does, you know, it, it, you know, 18 months in isn't a lot to really, you know, bring together a full picture, but what does success look like right now from your perch as a newly minted CEO of this organization? And, and how do you see that changing over the years? But what does success look like right now? So if we say, what does 2023 success look like? Um, I think it is that uh, we are really proud of the startups that come to the finals um, and that we have done, it, you know, it goes both ways, right? That yeah. they feel really happy that they were part of this organization and that they got everything at, that they want out of the experience and that we have um, awesome fundable businesses um, at the end of it. That's right. Um, Long-term success is that we should be a household name. You should say Nobel prize, Hult prize. Oh, um, that's all right, everybody. Care. Take but that in. Gonna, we're going to get there. Lori, seriously. And folks, as you get more familiar with this process, this is student empowered entrepreneurship and for social enterprise purposes to really make a difference and an impact on the planet. And as you know, this year it's the refashioning, redesigning fashion. And, you know, because this industry, the fashion industry needs an urgent makeover, something fierce. Um, we all know the landfill, all the problems with clothing. And, and what we learned from when we had Lisa uh, on the show with her business, was that you know you can take this clothing, melt it down, send it through processes, and the next thing you know, you've got thread that you can repurpose for clothing. Plus the one you mentioned, digital clothing. I'm so excited to see what comes out this year. Folks, you've got to follow Halt Prize because you're going to start seeing things with the competitions, right? And then yeah. you're going to come hear their ideas and go, oh my gosh. And you're going to see these wonderful, just like when we saw the video up front, you know, everybody's waving, smiling. It's really how everyone is. It's, it's a team effort and everybody's cheering each other on something fierce. Um, any thought, you know, anything else you'd like to say and, and share with us about the health prize before I start getting into some of the uh, mindset uh, gifts that you have to share with folks for when they're in the CEO seat, but what else would you want yeah. us to know about the health prize? So the thing that I always make sure to tell our students is that what we're asking them to do is what the founder of EF genuinely, literally did. He was in college. He, uh, Bertel Holt is um, severely dyslexic. 
as are all of his sons. Um, and so even though he was in an academic institution, he didn't feel successful and he knew there was a better way to educate people like himself. And so he started from his dorm room, a program to bring students to England to learn English experientially by being in the environment. And that was the beginning of what is now a global leader in education. So it's totally possible. And I, I think it's, it's um, for me, it, having been in the nonprofit sector and now supporting for-profit businesses, I do really believe that the for-profit businesses are the ones that are going to actually make those huge yeah. changes. The nonprofit sector has a lot of struggles. Um, and uh, in order to make it compelling for more and more people to join, like the, the number of people who can work in the nonprofit sector is always going to be um, constrained by who can afford to work in the nonprofit sector. Right. Um, but the for-profit sector is essentially unlimited and also has this capacity to make really significant change in the world. Um, so uh, I hope they're inspired by the, the example of the founder of EF having done exactly what we're asking. Absolutely. Them to do. I've never heard that story. Mm. And from his dorm room that he had severe dyslexia, that's a hidden disability for right. sure. And he had to find a way and had to make a way for himself in the world. And uh, so through uh, EF, he did that. And he is an example. And he knows what these folks are going through as well. You know, the teams and the students, because he had done it himself. So I just love that something fierce. And um, hey, Mia Voss, thanks for skating in. Lori is amazing. And Hull Prize, you know how incredible this organization is and how we feel about all the incredible work that this organization is doing, and we're going to hold that vision. Nobel Prize, Hulk Prize, right up there. there that go. is a big, hairy, audacious goal, and I yeah. love it, something fierce. And I'd like to see more uh, news coverage because, seriously, these pitch events are so uh, encouraging for those of us who think we're all going to die. <laughs> we're taking the planet down. Well, guess what? There's a solution to these problems, and these students are nailing it at Halt Prize, and very, very inspirational. So, Lori, as you've been you know, growing, and you told us that wonderful story in the beginning, how you really had to up your game as a manager and leader. What have do you use today, now that you know, a few decades later, as a leader for your mindset? Because you know, founders are often challenged with the shouldas, right, on themselves, shooting on themselves and feeling, you know, a lot of self-recrimination, beating themselves up. And there are really tough, tough days as a founder. What mindset hack would you like to offer them that has helped you get back in the saddle, tap into your grit and get out there? Well, first of all, I want to say how much I love the just ask uh, advice, because I think that's so, so true. Um, and uh, the proverb I'm now going to start quoting, I will attribute it to you um, about how long you are ignorant for if you do or don't ask. Um, so I, I think, you know, one of the very uh, tangible gifts growing older gives you is that you just don't care that much anymore. So you can sound foolish, say things that are wrong, you can make mistakes, and it doesn't impact your self-worth. And I think, you know, when I was younger, I probably felt like, oh, people will judge me if I, if I get this wrong. Right. Um, oh, and, of course. And what you learn over time is that actually admitting mistakes is the strongest thing you can do. Um, it is the thing that people most respect about you. It is the thing that allows you to grow and allows other people to grow around you. Um, and if you're not making mistakes, you're not pushing hard enough. So uh, that is, I think, something that we're really trying to instill across the Hull Prize um, is the idea that, uh, you know, fast is better than perfect um, and uh, that you should just test stuff out. And, and I'll say, you know, if, if you look at how the competition is rolling out uh, over the course of this year, we have learnings and we will adjust it for 2024 because we tried some things and some things worked well and other things we were kind of like, mm, that wasn't perfect. 
Um, but we tried things. We didn't stay with. Uh, right. You got to pull on threads, everybody. It's just as soon as you realize that thread is not going to work, you you go and reiterate on something else, but you have to experiment. <laughs> Your business is an experiment. And again, you don't know what you don't know. When you pull on those threads and you say, you're going to try this instead of going, oh no, it didn't work. Let's just all, you know, give up. You, know, you say, no, that didn't work. That's great information. Why didn't it work? Ooh, that means we can go here, which is why I'm saying that your comment admitting mistakes is the strongest thing you can do. Well, that's a stitch that on a pillow moment, everybody. It's not just the willingness to make the mistake, but just going, I so made that mistake. And as you said, as you get older, you're like, yeah, I made the mistake. What? <laughs> Whatever. I still have worth. I still have contributions to make. And I, and I, you know, I'm a huge uh, musical theater person. I love Stephen Sondheim. And in one of his shows, he says, the truth, the choice may have been mistaken. The choosing was not. And I think that's such a profound way to kind of honor, okay, I made that choice at the time. It seemed like the right choice. No, it was not, as it turns out, but it's still legitimate that I made that choice. Yes. And I think that too is great advice, folks. We can have people around us who are, I mean, I was raised in a home. Oh my God, if you made a mistake, mm. it was like, forget it. Emotions for days. Yeah. And it was just, you know, so I feel so grateful that I've evolved into, I made a mistake. Yay. Mm -hmm. You know, what, is, what is, does it teach you? And I love that Sondheim quote. And I just love that you have that musical theater love and background. That's so great. A whole conversation about that. <laughs> uh, the other uh, resource that I would love to share um, mm -hmm. in this context is the book um, Switch by Dan and Chip Heath. Um, and one of the things that they say in there is turn a bad day into good data. Um, which I think is such a profound way to think about, you know, whatever it is that 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 went wrong, um, to give that uh, a teaching oh. rather than uh, recrimination. And what was the name of the book? Uh, it's Switch. Just S W I T C H. Mm -hmm. I'll Dan put the Dan I'll put a link in the show notes, everyone. Yeah, their book Decisive also a must read. Yeah. And decisive too. Okay. Two really great uh, resources for oh, books. We love that because we have to always be up in our game, right? Founders. Okay. And you know, the beauty of turn a bad day into good data. You know what that does for you folks? It helps you be an observer on your business. It helps you pretend that. you know, you're in a lab and like, Ooh, look what happened in that experiment. You're not going to take that experiment personally. You're going to say, right. okay, that was a disaster. And raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Yep, that was a disaster. But what did we learn? And how do I take that data and turn it into so? Laurie, you are just the gift that keeps on giving with all this great advice. I love it, love it, love it. Write me that, <laughs> that quote about choice mistakes. Love it, love it too. And yes, Richard L., one of my favorites, <laughs> Stitch Out of the Pillows, is you don't know what you don't know. True. And that's why we have to stay so open to learning, always be learning as founders. Oh my gosh, this has been such a delicious conversation. What hard thing are you working on now at the Help Prize? What can the Startup Life Live community do to help add wind to the prize's sales and you know keep the conversation going and, and help it reach its goal of Nobel Prize, Help Prize? <laughs> uh, so uh, continuing to uh, make this opportunity known to more and more people, I think we, we definitely are always looking for ways to tell people about Hold Prize because there are still far too many people who could be involved who just don't know that we exist. Um, and I think the other piece is uh, to help us connect our uh, founders as they move through the process, those that want to continue as founders to help connect them to ecosystems in their home countries um, so that they can uh, continue to thrive. I think, for example, I know we had a viewer from Nairobi, we actually do have a really nice uh, ecosystem happening in Kenya where we have two of our Hull Prize million dollar winners are Kenyan. Uh, we had Boo Pass in, I want to say 2016, and then our uh, 2022 winners, Ikobana. Um, Ikobana is getting support from the federal government uh, in Kenya to help make their idea a reality. Um, so they there have, they are on the big screen, folks. We're sharing a photo for those uh, who are listening to the podcast yes. of these three winners. What does their business do? What's the name? 
So Ecobana is a uh, company that is producing um, women's sanitary products using banana fiber. So the um, waste from the banana harvest. Um, and they're actually a four person team. They have a woman on their team who unfortunately could not get her visa in time to come and pitch in uh, New York City. So they. Yeah, were, I mean, all guys with sanitary. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, but I have to say, they are so dedicated. And uh, in their acceptance speech, they said, um, it's time for men to stand up. And, you know, period poverty is not a woman's issue, it's a human issue. And there was not a dry eye in the house. Um, they were just so passionate about this issue because in Kenya and in many, many countries around the world, if you are a girl or a woman, you have your period, you do not have products to manage that period, you don't get to go to school, you don't get to go to work, you have to stay home. So it is not just an issue of, um, you know, sanitation, it's an right. issue of education, it's an, it's an issue of, of employment. Um, so it has really deep um, impacts on, uh, on societies. And so the idea is that Using So you've got a, an environmental benefit because you're using these fibers that are otherwise just uh, going into landfill and you have a, a real access and women's equality benefit as well. Oh my gosh, right. That's like the ideal example know, of the Hull right. Prize, and which is why they won. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, that's terrific. Can't wait to learn more about that product. Can't wait to, you know, see everybody locally on February 18th for the Boston Halt School of Business's uh, local pitch event. I get to, I'm so honored to be a judge. I'm so grateful that you live so nearby, Lori, so that I can mm -hmm. hug you and have coffee with you and have, you know, one-on-one -on -one really great conversations with you. Any last thoughts before I pop you into the green room and wrap up the show? Well, first of all, thank you. This has been such a pleasure. And I will come see you on the 18th so that we can uh, have an in-person moment and, and uh, support our HALT students as they go through this journey. Um, and otherwise, I just think, you know, uh, one of the things that people frequently say to me that I feel so honored to be able to represent is that women can be leaders. Um, so thank you for being a woman leader and for amplifying the voices of women leaders because uh, there are still too many of our uh, sisters who don't think that they can actually found businesses. That's um, right. And, uh, who don't think they deserve funding. Um, yes, and that, that's where a lot of women really stumble is in the funding part and exactly. I keep working on that as well. Exactly. Oh my gosh, Lori, thank you for leading this incredible group and this incredible prize and this incredible foundation. I mean, everything about the Health Prize is global scale and you are ideally qualified this for this. Your whole life has prepared you for this moment, which is what I, like. I actually generally genuinely do feel that way. So I'm incredibly fortunate. Oh, I am so grateful. And thank you for all you do. And thank you to the Hulk prize team. Thank you for coming on the show and sharing this amazing organization with us. I'm a huge fan and I hope we have more there. I'm going to yeah. pop you in the green room. Thank you, thank Laurie. You. Bye everybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I hope you're as, as inspired as I clearly am. I could glow on forever about this amazing organization. Be sure to follow them at Halt Prize. Um, let me share with you who's coming up next on the Startup Life Live show. <clears throat> it's Cindy Fosu. She's the founder and CEO of Information Systems Builder, a marketing firm for tech startups. Cindy loves solving the problem facing many tech founders how to market their products and services to their ideal customers. It's going to be a delicious conversation because tech founders, you know, how do I do the marketing, right? Well, Cindy's team will do it for you and help you implement the right strategy. So I hope you can tune in. And how do you know whenever I'm interviewing another great guest, another startup founder or investor, you join the Startup Life Live meetup group. Yay. Links are in the show notes and there's a QR code right there for you to scan. Come join us so that you receive an alert whenever I post a new show. In the meantime, I want you to promise me that you'll always remember to the best of your ability, you're braver than you seem, stronger than you believe, right? 
And as we say in here in Boston, you're wicked smarter than you think, right? <laughs> You've got this, founders. I'm cheering wildly for you. And until I see you again, I'm wishing you a delicious day everywhere you glow. Mwah. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. <laughs>